الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلی علی وصاحب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والعصر ان الانسان لفی خسر الا الذین آمنوا وعملوا صالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر رب شلی صدری ویسلی امری کلانتان It was my desire for many years to visit the state of Malaysia which people always told me was the most amongst all the states of Malaysia the most islamic practicing state was Kuantan and I'm happy to be here as the invitation of the chief minister of Kuantan and to the morning when I went to the mosque for the fajr salah that's one way of knowing how islamic the state is i was very happy to see alhamdulillah half the mosque was filled and i saw many ladies also there which really alhamdulillah i was happy and i do agree mashallah that this is one of the signs that there were elderly people there were middle aged people there were even young people there in the mosque and i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he guide the state and may he make the state more and more islamic and close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the topic of this evening talk of mine is quran the path to happiness or islam the path to happiness before we delve into the topic let us understand what is the meaning of the word happiness according to the miriam's webster dictionary happiness is a state of well-being and contentment it is a satisfying and a well-being feeling of experience it's a satisfying and good feeling of experience according to the oxford dictionary happiness means a feeling of pleasure or showing of pleasure and contentment according to the psychologist they have a slightly different definition or description of happiness the psychologists they tell us that happiness is a continuous feeling of delight of enjoyment of satisfaction and generosity it is a contentment of one's self and one's life and it is a belief in blissful destiny so this definition given by psychologists it slightly differs it has three components number 1 a continuous feeling of delight of enjoyment of generosity and satisfaction number 1 number 2 it is the contentment of one self and one's life and number 3 it is a belief in blissful destiny number 1 continuous number 2 it is contentment and number 3 that it is a belief all these three put together the psychology that tell us it is happiness happiness can be divided into three types into three categories 
Number one, it is the false happiness. It is for a very short period and it's mainly achieved by getting a sudden good fortune. For example, if a person has drugs, he forgets all his worries, all his tension, and is in a state of happiness, which is short-lived. Or a person has alcohol, he gets into a sudden good fortune state, he forgets his worry, but the moment the effect goes down, he is in a more worse state than what he was before. So what does he do? He has more drugs, he has more alcohol, he gets addicted, and his life is ruined. So this is false happiness. It is short-lived. And it can cause various problems. It can cause physical problem to the body. It can cause psychological problem. It can cause mental problem. It can cause physiological problem. This is the first category. The second category is the temporary happiness. It is for a temporary period. It may be longer than the short-lived happiness. And it is achieved by achieving a goal. This temporary happiness is acquired by achieving a goal. Depending upon the goal, the person may strive to achieve that goal. Maybe for a few hours, for a few days, for a few weeks, for years, and then he achieves the goal. The moment he achieves the goal, he gets happiness. This happiness is temporary. Depending upon the goal he achieves, it may last for a few minutes. This happiness can last for a few hours. It can last for a few days. Or sometimes for a few years. But it is temporary. This temporary happiness is not as dangerous as the first category of false happiness. It may, it may not cause damage to the body. It doesn't cause physiological loss or a psychological loss in most of the cases. The third category of happiness is the true happiness. This true happiness, it is continuous happiness. When your happiness is continuous and forever, it is true happiness. And as I mentioned, it matches with the definition given by the psychologist. That this happiness is a continuous feeling of delight, of enjoyment, of generosity, of satisfaction. And it is contentment of oneself and one's life. And there is a belief in blissful destiny. So all these three put together is the true happiness. There are various things that we human beings do to achieve happiness. Time will not permit to discuss all, but we'll discuss the major things that people do to achieve happiness. One of the most common things that people do, do to achieve happiness is to acquire possessions, acquire wealth, acquire material things. Some get pleasure by acquiring goods, by having a good house. Some may get pleasure and happiness by having a good watch. Some by having a good motorcycle, some by good car. You know, some may want that they want to have a yacht. If you go on a higher level, some want to have a jet plane. So all these are positions. Some want to acquire wealth, want to become a billionaire. One of the common factors is to acquire position, wealth, and material goods. The second type that people get happiness is by getting power. You know, everyone wants power. If you're in a school and if you're a teacher, you'd want to become the head teacher. You want to become the principal. If you're an organization, you want to become a manager. You want to become a CEO. If you're a politician, you want to become a member of state legislative member, maybe member of parliament want to become a chief minister, some want to become then later on become a prime minister. All these 
achieving power. They get happiness if they achieve this power. Some people get happiness by achieving fame. And to get famous, people should know me. You know, what is the number of followers on my Facebook, on my Twitter, how many people are my fans, whether it may be a rock star or it may be a celebrity, it may be an actor, it may be a sportsman, fame. People achieve happiness by acquiring fame. Some people achieve happiness by obtaining women. More women we get, we are more happy. Some buy wine and alcohol. Happiness is a false happiness. Some by having drugs, so they forget all their worries. Some by music. Some by meditation. Some acquire happiness through the husbands and wives. Some acquire happiness by their children. Some acquire happiness by achieving a career. There are various factors. These are some of the important factors how people try to acquire happiness. And many of them through a combination of the ones I've mentioned. But all these happiness, they either fall in the first category, that is fake happiness, or false happiness, drugs, alcohol, women. Or they may be in the second category, temporary happiness, by having position of wealth, or the power, or the fame, it's limited. You cannot continuously have power. There's always somebody more powerful than you. There's somebody more famous than you. All these are short-lived. How do you acquire true happiness? True happiness, as I mentioned, is continuous. It is forever. It's not fake. It's not false. It's not temporary. All this, the wealth you have, even if you are, if you are the richest man in the world, you will not, the happiness will not be continuous. And I'll come to that later on. You may have power, but yet you don't receive continuous happiness. Happiness is not the, the happiness is not the absence of conflict in life, but it is the ability to cope with it. Let me repeat the statement. Happiness comes not from the absence of conflict in life, but it comes from the ability to cope with it. So many people think that if there is no conflict in life, you are happy, but this is fake happiness, like having drugs, having alcohol. The true happiness comes from the ability to cope with the conflicts. I'm asking a simple question. Who is the best person who can tell you how to cope with the conflicts in lives of the human beings? Who can tell you the best? The best person who can tell you how to cope with the conflicts of life in the life of a human being, it is our creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our creator and he is the best person who can tell you. So the only way you can achieve true happiness is by accepting Islam. Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are a Muslim who follows the Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are a practicing Muslim. If you follow the Quran, which is the guidance of our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the last and final guidance. It is the best book available on the face of the earth. If you follow the Quran and the Hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will achieve true happiness. Someone may ask me, that why will you achieve true happiness if you accept Islam? And the reply is, because Islam has the solution to the problems of humankind. Islam has the solution
to the problems of humankind. And there are various verses that you can quote that relate to happiness. Time will not permit us in this short duration that we have. There are 6,236 verses of the Quran, out of which majority, directly or indirectly, are dealing with happiness. The best verse, verse of the Quran, which shows you how to achieve happiness, is the verse I started, the surah I started my talk with, Surah Al Asr, chapter 103, verse number 1 to 3, where Allah says, Wal Asr, Inna al Insana fi Khusr, Illa ladina amanu, wa amilu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqqi, wa tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is verily in loss. Here Allah is taking the oath of time, Wal Asr. Inna al Insana la fi Khusr. Human beings are verily in a state of loss, except those who have the four criteria. Those who have Iman, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria required for anyone to achieve the true happiness. This surah of the Quran is called as Rahe Nijat, the path for salvation, the path to Jannah, the path to happiness. And Imam Shafi, may Allah have mercy on him, he said that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have only revealed this surah alone, it would have been sufficient for hidayah, for the guidance of the human being. Imagine Imam Shafi Rahimullah, such a great personality, such a great Imam, he says only if this surah was revealed, Surah Al-Asr, it would have been sufficient for the hidayah, for the guidance of humankind. And when we analyze and when we read the Quran, almost all the verses of the Quran, they fall under any one of these four criteria. Either it talks about Iman, it talks about righteous deed, it talks about Watawasa bil Haq, inviting people to truth, or Watawasa bil Sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. Any verse of the Quran you pick up, it falls in one of these four criteria. This surah, Surah Al Asr, of the glorious Quran shows us the pathway to happiness. And if you want to dwell into detail, you pick up any verse of the Quran, invariably, directly or indirectly, it will show you how to achieve true happiness. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Kahf, chapter number 18, verse number 107, 108, Allah says, those are the believers who do righteous deed and they will enter Jannah and the paradise to live therein forever. And they would not want a transfer from there. Ya Allah is saying that the, those are the believers who do righteous deed and they enter Jannah, that is paradise, to be therein eternally forever. And they would not want a transfer because when we receive that true happiness, you would not like to leave it. There are various verses which talk about happiness. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 35, Inna al Muslimina wal Muslimati, for Muslim men and women, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minati, for believing men and women. Walqanitina walqanitati for devout men and women. Wasadikina wasadikati for true men and women. Walqashiina walqashiati for men and women who humble themselves. Walmutasaddakina walmutasaddikati for men and women who give in charity. Walhafidina furujum walhafidati for men and women who protect the modesty. For men and women who engage much in Allah's praise. And Allah continues. And Allah ends the verse.
Allah has prepared forgiveness and ample of reward. This reward is going to Jannah, achieving the happiness, entering paradise. And if you analyze, this verse starts with saying, Inna al muslimina wal muslimati. For verily, the Muslim men and women. Muslim men and women means those who submit their will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The highest level. If you submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala totally, then you are a true Muslim. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 28, mikafa. Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Then Allah is giving, then breaks up in individual levels of happiness. Well, menina wal mu'minati, for believing men and women, those who believe, the men and women, they will go to Jannah. Well, qanitina wal qanitati, for the devout men and women, they shall enter Jannah. Wa sadiqina wa sadiqati, for true men and women, inshallah they shall enter Jannah. Well, khashina wal khashiyati, for men and women who humble themselves, who pray, who do khush in salah, they will enter Jannah. Those who give in charity, Allah says they will enter Jannah. For those who protect the modesty and guard the modesty, they shall enter Jannah. Those who engage much men and women in the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will do zikr. You know, my name is mentioned, Zakri and Zakirat. I, my name comes from this verse of the Quran, Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 35. Those who engage much in Allah's place, inshallah, they shall go to Jannah. And for them, Allah has prepared forgiveness and ample of reward. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110. Kuntum khaira ummatin khrijat lin nas. Oi Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor and calling us the khaira ummah. Whenever Allah gives an honor, it is always followed up with responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. In a school, a teacher has got more honor than a clerk. The principal has got more honor than a teacher. Similarly, the teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. A principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. Allah in this verse is telling us that we Muslims are the khaira ummah, best of peoples. Don't you think we have a responsibility? Allah continues and says, Ta'miruna bil ma'rufi wa al-munkar wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. Allah is calling us the khaira ummah, the best of people because... We are supposed to enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong. We are supposed to do dawa. If you see something is wrong, you have to correct it. If you see a Muslim doing wrong and you correct it, that's called islah, to repair, to improve. If you see a non-Muslim doing something wrong and you invite him towards Islam, that's called as dawa. If you do not do dawa, if you do not invite people to the way of Islam, you are unfit to be called as Muslims. You are unfit to be called as khaira ummah. You, if you read the Quran, there are various guidances that you get. And this Islam is a balanced religion. Some, the materialistic people, they think only about the material world and this body. Some religion talk only about spiritual aspect. Islam has a striking balance between the two. The physical body as well as the spiritual soul. As Allah says in the Quran, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 143, that we have made you an ummate wast, a middlemost community, so that you may be a witness over the nations and the Prophet will be a witness over you. We are an ummate wast, a middlemost community. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, it's mentioned in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, poem number three, hadith number 1975. The beloved Prophet told to Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. Oh Abdullah, I have heard 
that you continuously fast throughout the days and you continuously pray throughout the nights. And Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anh, he replied, Yes, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet replied, Stop it. Fast one day and do not fast the next day. Pray part of the night, part of the night you should sleep. Because your body has a right over you. Your family has a right over you. Your guests have a right over you. That means, here the Prophet is talking about a balanced life. You can't say that I'll fast every day of my life. It's haram. It's not allowed. You can't say I'll fast throughout the night, every night of my life. It's not allowed. If certain nights, Laitul Qadr, last ten nights, Alhamdulillah. But not every night of your life. Fasting in month of Ramadan, one month, yes. But not every day of the full year. Because your body has right over you. Your family, you have to give time to your family. You have to give time to your guests. It is a balanced way of life. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 28. Verily, in the remembrance of Allah, do heart finds contentment. A believer is one who when remembers Allah, he finds contentment. Verily, in the remembrance of Allah, will heart finds contentment. That means if you remember Allah, you get the true happiness in your heart. And this happiness, when you keep on doing zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will be permanent. It will not be temporary. It's not like you get some wealth and then you lose it, what will happen? If you truly remember Allah in the right way as you should and do zikr of Allah, your heart will be content. And the best example I can give you, is of Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah. Some of you may be aware that he was a mujaddid of Islam. As the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari says, every hundred years, there will be one person who will revive Islam. And as given the title of Sheikh al-Islam, his lifestyle is worth for the Muslims to read and to learn from. Ibn Taymiyyah, May Allah have mercy on him, Rahimullah. When he was threatened by the enemy that they'll imprison him, he was threatened of being executed. He replies, What can you do to me? If you imprison me, I would do zikr of Allah. I would remember Allah. If you exile me, I will do tafakkur. I will contemplate on the creation of Allah. If you execute me, I will become a shaheed. What can you do to me? My Jannah is in my heart. This is absolute true happiness. The false happiness can be taken away. If you're happy because you have a car, someone takes away the car, you will not feel happy. If wealth and gold is your happiness, someone robs it, you will not be happy. Here Ibn Taymiyyah is telling to his enemies, what can you do to me? If you imprison me, I will do zikr of Allah. I'll have more time to do zikr. I'll get closer to Allah. If you exile me, remove me from this land, I'll do tafakkur. Contemplate on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on his creation. If you execute me, I will be a shaheed. And what better thing that you can ask for? Your life is sacrificed for being a witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this example that you have, and he says, my Jannah is in my heart. You cannot take my Jannah. You cannot take away my happiness. Because happiness is in the heart. Whether you torture him, whether you give him trials and tribulation, this happiness, true happiness, remains. This true happiness will remain irrespective whether in good times or bad times. Whether you have problems or no problem. Whether you are rich or whether you are poor. Whether you have conflicts in life or don't have, this is true happiness. This happiness cannot be taken away from the believer. 
if he is a practicing believer, if he is a Muslim, surely no one can take this happiness irrespective of what they do to you. And Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya was the student of Ibn Taymiyyah. He says that Ibn Taymiyyah led a life of poverty. He was poor. His enemies threatened him. They imprisoned him. But I have not seen a more happier person than Ibn Taymiyyah. In fact, in spite of these trials and tribulation, he was happy. And this is the level of a believer and a Muslim. The more trials and tribulation that come, because the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, the higher the trial and tribulation you'll have, the higher status you'll get in Jannah. And the Prophet said, the biggest trials and tribulations were on the Ambiyas, on the messengers. That's the reason their status is the highest. So more difficult, more difficulties come in life. And if you can cope, it, cope with it on the basis of Quran and Sunnah, you get a higher status in Jannah. So that's the reason those who don't know true happiness, they think that they can take away happiness. And all of us, if we look back into our life, somewhere or the other you may have realized that even we may have gone for this temporary happiness. Maybe not for the fake happiness, alhamdulillah, but at least for temporary happiness. Surely you might have thought that even I want something, some position. And I remember that when I was a child, I wanted a cycle. And I got the cycle, I was happy. But for how long? Maybe for a few days. And when I was in school, you know, I want how people are coming out, getting prizes in class. Alhamdulillah, I was good in mathematics. That was my favorite subject. And most of the years, I got prize in mathematics. Do you know, I did not read a single book. You know, we used to get a book. Novels and books. I did not read a single book, complete book. In any of the years, I got the prize in. When I used to see sports, oh, mashallah, they're getting gold medal. You know, even I want a gold medal. Allah made it possible in the later part, when I went to college, I got a gold medal for 10 kilometers for long distance running. But what was that happiness? Temporary. Got the gold medal. Oh, where did it reach you? Where did you reach with that? But natural, that was before we got involved in the field of Dawah. When we got involved in the field of Dawah again, you know the person who inspired me was Sheikh Ahmad Didar. May Allah grant him mercy. May Allah grant him Janata Firdaus, inshallah. And we wanted to be like Sheikh Ahmad Didar. And he was the immediate person who we could imitate, we can emulate. And he was the person who changed me from a doctor of a body to doctor of a soul. Because by training, I'm a medical doctor. And we met a man, Alhamdulillah, Allah helped us. And then, I thought, oh, Sheikh Didat, MashaAllah, he gets big crowd, largest crowd in Birmingham for the debate of is the Bible or the Quran, Bible or the Quran, which is the word of God, but not Anis Farosh. And there are 12,000 people, so we were, MashaAllah. Will Allah make it possible that we get 12,000 people for our gathering? And in 2004, when I gave a talk on similarities between Islam and Hinduism, mashallah, there were about, about 20,000 people. So, getting 20,000 people, and we were happy. That was the initial stages of Dawah. But again, that happiness is temporary. Allah made it possible. 100,000 people came. The largest gathering I've addressed is more than a million people live. But believe me, at that time we were more matured. The million people meant nothing to me. We only wanted Allah to accept our effort in this way. Acceptance of Allah, even if you do dawah to one person, is much more better than doing dawah to a million people live and Allah not accepting it. So when we got involved in the field of dawah, we got more and more matured. I remember that when we, when we were a fan of Sheikh Didat and he got the King Faisal Award, 
ah, mashallah, highest award in the Islamic world. And then we realize that it's good, mashallah, may Allah grant him Jannah. Then Allah made it possible. We got the Dubai Holy Quran Award from Dubai. Then got the Malaysian Tokomal Lijri Award. Then Allah made it possible in 2015 for the King Faisal International Prize for the service of Islam. It's supposed to be the highest award in the Islamic world. And I think two Malaysians have got that award. One is Tun Dr. Mathir Muhammad. Mashallah. But again, we had matured by that time that our award for a Muslim, for a believer is Jannah. We only pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah accept our effort. Because the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, and he said, that there is a person who leads all his life doing good deeds and he's only one arm's length away from Jannah. And the devil overtakes him and he does a deed of Jahannam and he goes to Jahannam. And the Prophet said, there is a person who full life does the deeds of Jahannam and he's only one arm away his length from Jahannam and he does a good deed he does the deed of Jannah and Allah puts him in Jannah. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he accept our efforts. Our main is intention. That the deed that you do that will take you to Jannah is your intention. That what is the intention of yours? And if you do with true intention, Allah inshallah gives you this world as well as the akhirah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 156, that believers are those when a disaster falls on them, trials and tribulation, they say, Arham, they say, Inna lillahi wa inna rajiun. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. That from him we come and to him we return. Whenever any disaster befalls us, the believers say, from him we come, from Allah we come, and to Allah we return. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will get the true path. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, word number seven, hadith number 7500. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that the affairs of a believer is absolutely different and is always good. The faith are unique, but is always good. If a blessing befalls on the believer, he thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he praises him and that is good for him. If a calamity befalls on him, he is patient and constant. He does sabr and that is good for him. So in short, a believer, whether he has difficulties or whether he has pleasure, he always says, Alhamdulillah. People will say, how do you say Alhamdulillah? That is the way you think. When you make a profit in business, million ringgit, you say Alhamdulillah. Tomorrow you go and loss of 100,000 ringgit, what do you do? Do you curse? A believer will say, Alhamdulillah, only 100,000 ringgit loss. Maybe it could have been 200,000 ringgit. It could have been half a million ringgit. So believers always, he's optimist. He says, Alhamdulillah, only 100,000 ringgit loss. Therefore, a believer should thank on what he has, not what he doesn't have. This is the true status of a believer. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad he said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, one number eight, hadith number 6268, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, O oh Abu Dar, if I had a mountain of gold equal to the mountain of Ohud, 
I would distribute it in charity in three days and only keep for myself a small amount to pay off my debts. Because the person who is rich in this world, he will be poor in the Akhirah unless he gives most of it or he gives from the wealth in charity and such people are very few. The Prophet said even if he had a mountain of gold equivalent to the Mount of Uhud, he would give everything in charity except keep a small amount to pay off his debt. That's it. Once he pays off his debt, he doesn't have anything of it. Nothing. Because the Prophet said the person who is rich in this world is poor in the Akhirah. Except if he spends his wealth on the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and such people are very few. Therefore, the Prophet said it's more difficult for a rich man to go to Jannah than a poor man. You know, normally we say, you know, oh, the man is so poor. You should be happy. Alhamdulillah. More chances to go to Jannah. This life is temporary life. You live for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 100, how many years? The average human being lives this for 70 to 80 years. So when we look at the people who have difficulties, Actually, and if they pass the difficulty on the basis of Quran and Sunnah, there are more chances of going to Jannah. That's what Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 85. That when you intercede or you're in between in doing some good deeds, you'll get the reward of that good deed. If you do intercession or intervene in something of the evil deed, you'll get part of the evil punishment. The most important factor in achieving happiness, that is Jannah, number one, it is Tawheed. Allah says in the Quran, which I said earlier in my talk, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 28, that believers are those who remember Allah and find contentment in the heart. Verily, in the remembrance of Allah, there is contentment of heart. The best definition that anyone can give of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quote to you Surah Ikhlas, chapter 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul hu Allahu ahad, say is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad, Allah the absolute eternal. Lam yilid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. If any person who believes in a God, and if that God falls in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. Number one, Kul Allahu Ahad. Say the Allah one and only. Number two, Allah Samad, Allah the absolute eternal. Lam yilad wa lam yulad. He begets not noisy begotten. Walam yakullahu kuffana. There's nothing like him. And I've given a talk on concept of God in major world religions. And I've dealt in detail about Surah Ikhlas and about the Tawheed. But time will not permit us to deal here. But the other verse of the Quran, which is called as Ayt al Qursi, the verse of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 255, it describes the quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu la ilaha wal hayyul kayyum, la ta khuzu sinata wa nanom, lahu maafi samawati wa maafi lard. That it is He. There is no God but Allah. The absolute the eternal. No slumber can seize Him, nor does He require rest. To Him belongs everything in the heavens. And His throne extends in the heavens and the earth. To him belongs everything in the heavens and the earth, and his throne extends. He does not feel any, any fatigue in guarding him. These are talking about the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 14, that I am Allah, there is no God besides me. You worship me alone and praise me. That means Allah says he is the only 
God. La ilaha illallah. There is no God besides Allah. And you should worship Him alone and no one else. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 186, that when they ask you, O Prophet Muhammad about me, tell them I'm closer to you, I'm near you, and I will answer all your prayers. I'm close to you, and I will answer all your prayers. And when the supplicant calls me, I respond to him. But when I tell him, when I give him guidance, you should obey me also. So that he will be rightly guided. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking that he listens to his creation. But when he gives guidance, the creation to listen to him. And the biggest sin in Islam, the biggest hurdle for you to achieve the happiness, to achieve Jannah, is shirk. Associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 48. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 48. And Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 116. That Allah will never forgive the sin of shirk. Associating partners with him. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive. But anyone who has committed shirk, associated partners with Allah, he has done a heinous crime. He has done a major sin. So the biggest sin in Islam and the major hurdle to achieve true happiness, it is shirk associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 22, that if there were gods more than Allah, more than one Allah, there have been confusion in the universe. Allah says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 91, that if Allah had begotten a son, and if there were more gods other than Allah, each one would have hoarded one on top of the other. And there have been confusion in the universe. So Tawheed is the most important. And when we believe in this Tawheed and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we realize that we become slaves only of Allah and no other creation. Most of us, you know, we are slaves or, you know, we are more obedient to our bosses, to our manager, to our ministers, rather than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once you have this concept of Tawheed, you become slave only of Allah. You fear no one but Allah. Otherwise, you are fearing, you know, okay, my boss may take me out for my job. Well, you think that he's giving you risk. You don't know that Allah is giving risk. You're afraid of saying something to your manager. You only fear Allah and no one else. And Allah says in the Quran, it is Allah who has ordained for you when you will die. And no one can change that. So once you believe in this one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawheed, you know that your death has been destined. You cannot live one day more, not even one hour more, not even a second more. And no one can kill you if Allah has ordained for that. No one can kill you one day earlier or one hour earlier or even a second earlier. So if you have this faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your happiness is in your heart. The Jannah is in your heart. How am I that I am setting you? You will be surely comfortable. And you know that being a die of Islam, the more people listen to you, the more problems you have. And we have Peace TV channel. The more popular it became, we had more enemies. The enemies of Islam were after you. And you know that one of the countries which is against the Muslims, that is India, which is being ruled by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, you know, just a couple of months back, to win the election, he took my name nine times in less than two minutes. MashaAllah. The Prime Minister of India to come back to power, taking the name of Zakir Naik. Zakir Naik. His accent. Nine times in a span of less than two minutes. Allah Akbar. I did not know that I was so important that for him to come back to power, he had to take my name nine times. 
Mashallah, I did not know that I was so important. And they tried their level best. Tried to lab label me as a terrorist so that I cannot travel. Then came to hate crime, then came to money laundering. Mashallah. Allah is there, they tried to attach the property. And I told my family that see, whatever property is there, if it goes in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what better can it be? Imagine you have a lot of wealth and then maybe a robber comes and robs it. What happens? Maybe you invest in business and you go in loss. What will happen? Earthquake comes and a house is gone. I told my family, think all our property zero. Whatever comes is bonus. What better use can we make of our property than spending in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Imagine, because I'm a die, they want to confiscate everything. Alhamdulillah. What better? And believe me, this wealth, it got me more happiness. They thought they're going to cause me problem. And I thanked Narendra Modi. Why I thanked him? Because I'm coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The millions, the tens of millions of dollars he spent on doing anti-propaganda against me. People started cursing me. You know, I'll get the reward in Jannah. Because of him, I'm in Malaysia, alhamdulillah. A country which is better than India. I've come to Malaysia many times. I never thought in my wildest dream that I'll be, I'll be staying in Malaysia. Even when I got the PR many years back, I never thought I'll be using it. They gave it to me, I took it. Alhamdulillah. I got permanent residency. So it is Haza bin Fazi Rabbi. Because of him, I came to a better land. Alhamdulillah. My Iman became strong. My attachment with Allah became strong. So they cannot take the Jannah which is in the heart of a believer. They cannot. They think by taking your wealth, they will try and cripple you. No. Our faith in Allah increases more. And we have to continue our work with much more vigor. And we get guidance from the Quran regarding how to achieve happiness. And the important factor is love Allah and His Rasul. Very important factor. Is loving Allah and His Rasul. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, in kana abakum, say whether it be for say whether it be for your fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum, or your spouses, husbands or wives, wa ashiratukum, or your relatives. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they, your, are they your brothers? Are they your spouses, husbands, or wives? Are they your relatives? And Allah continues. The wealth they have amassed, the business in which you deal, the houses in which you live. You know, you may think that if I start doing dawah, maybe my wealth will be taken away. So you're afraid to do dawah. No, and especially nowadays, dangerous. Are you afraid of your wealth being taken away? Are you afraid that the house that you live in will be taken away? The business in which you deal, people are afraid that, you know, if I do that one, maybe business will go down. It is the opposite. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they your brothers? Are they your spouses, husbands or wives? Are they your relatives? Is it the wealth you have that you have amassed? Is it the house in which you live? Is it the business in which you deal? And Allah continues. That Ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi. If you love all these eight things more than Allah, more than his Rasul, and more than doing jihad, striving and struggling in the way of Allah. Allah says, Fatarabbasu, you wait. Hatta yati Allahi bi amri. Wallahu ila azulkum al fasakim. Wait until Allah brings about his decision unto you. Until Allah brings about his destruction unto you. And Allah guides not the fasak people. Your Allah is telling that if you love all these eight things more than Allah, more than his Rasul, and more than doing jihad, striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Fatarabbasu, wait until Allah brings about a destruction unto you and Allah guides not the Fasik people. So for a believer, for a moment, for a Muslim, 
نمبر ون از اللہ نے رسول اینڈ آو بلوڈ پروفٹ محمد صلی اللہ وسلم سیٹ اٹس مینشن ان سائی بخاری وائم نمبر ون حدیث نمبر سکسٹین دا پروفٹ سیٹ اے بلیور از ناٹ اے ٹرو بلیور انٹل ہی اچیو تھری تھنگس نمبر ون دیٹ ہی لوز اللہ اینڈ از رسول more than all other creations in this world. Number two, you love for the sake of Allah. And number three, you hate going back to disbelief, kufr, so that you'll go to Jahannam. You will not be a true believer until you have three things complete. You will not be a true believer. Number one, You love Allah and His Rasul more than anyone in this world. More than your father, more than your mother, more than your children, more than your manager, more than, more than your CEO, more than your minister, more than your chief minister, more than your prime minister, more than your king. You love them more than anyone in the world. Unless you don't achieve that state, you'll not be a true believer. Unfortunately, even our Muslims, you know, when, when we come in front of our boss, our manager, No, we are so much afraid. We want to please him more. And if the time for salah is there, the adhan is there. No, no, I have to meet my manager. So you go and meet your manager and don't answer the call for salah. That means you love your manager, you love your boss more than Allah. Therefore, I tell anyone, anyone comes in competition with me in face of Allah, he will lose. We are very particular. When you hear the call for Adhan, that is the most important appointment of your life. That's the appointment with Allah. There is no appointment more important than the appointment with Allah. Five times a day, minimum. You will not be a true believer until you love for sake of Allah. If you love anyone, you love him for the sake of Allah. And you hate going back to Kufr. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, hadith number 660. Our beloved Prophet said that there will be no other shade except the shade of Allah. On that day, there will be seven people who will be under the shade of Allah on the day where there will be no other shade except the shade of Allah. Talking about the Akhirah. There will be seven categories of people who will be in the shade of Allah, under the protection of Allah. On that day, where there will be no other shade. And the Prophet said, number one, a just ruler. Number two, a man who's brought up worshipping Allah. Number three, a person whose heart is attached to the mosque. Number four, two people who who love each other for the sake of Allah and they part also on the same. Number five, a man to whom a beautiful lady comes and wants to seduce him and he says, I fear Allah. Number six, a person who gives charity in such a way that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand has given charity. And number seven, a person who remembers Allah and he cries. All these seven categories of people will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And repeat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he put us under his shade. Because if you're under his shade, you're protected. And you surely will get ultimate happiness. If you're under his protection. And we realize... that loving Allah and His Rasul is the most important. And unless we don't love Him more than ourselves, more than our relatives, you will not achieve the true level of Iman. There are various factors in achieving the true happiness. Time will not permit us. I'll just mention a few. In short, if you read the Quran, 
read the Quran daily with understanding, implement on it, you will achieve happiness. Quran is the path to happiness. And if you analyze, there are different types of sins. Some are major sin, some are medium, some are minor sins. Abstain from the major sin. And we know that number one major sin, it is shirk. And we discussed that. Believe in Tawheed, abstain from shirk. Number two is murder, abstain from it. Then is sahar, that black magic. Number four is that if you don't offer salah. Offering salah five times a day is compulsory. And preferable, or I should say compulsory, pray in the mosque along with jamaat for the gents. Giving zakat, if you have to give. Charity. Charity, zakat is a fard, and if you give more charity beside that, that is the best. Fasting, because our beloved prophet said, that Allah said, there is no deed done only for the sake of Allah except fasting. There is no deed that is done only for the sake of Allah except fasting. Other deeds, if you pray, maybe you are doing it to show to someone else. If you give charity, maybe you want to let people know that you are charitable. But fasting is a deed which you only do for Allah because you can go in the kitchen and eat and no one will come to know. So if you are truly fasting, it's only for Allah and no one else. So Allah says that fasting is the only deed where a person does only for me and no one else. Performing Hajj if you have to. If you don't do, it's the seventh major sin. Being obedient to your parents, number eight. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 27 and 24, that we have ordained that you worship none but Allah, and that you be kind to your parents. And if one of them or both of them reach old age, do not say a word of contempt, don't say off to them. But lower to them your wing of humility. And pray to the Lord that bless them as they cherish me in childhood. Now imagine being obedient to your parents, the happiness that you get, and your pathway to Jannah, Taking care of your relatives, your kith and kins. If you don't take care, that is the ninth major sin. Tenth major sin, it is zina. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, come not close to adultery, to zina, it's an evil opening other roads to evil. You know, people may go after women, they do zina, this is false happiness. It is false happiness. There can be various problems in life, your family can get ruined, you can get many diseases, all these is false happiness. And Allah says, the, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hud, that are you preferring men over to women? Talking about homosexuality, which is the 11th major sin. The 12th major sin, it is Rabah. It's interest. And many a times, people take interest from the bank. They take a loan on interest from the bank, thinking that they will achieve happiness. You know, with that loan, they buy a house. Interest, a loan taken on interest is haram. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 278 and 279, that give up your demands of riba. And if you give it not up, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Means if you do not abstain from riba, from interest, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 278 and 279, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. One of the major factors to take you away from happiness is riba, is interest. And most of the people that you see taking interest and look at their lifestyle, they have problems in life. It takes you away from happiness. Time will not permit us to enumerate all the major sin. The 70 major sin, as the beloved prophet said, that major sin, the seven. But Ibn Abbas said that 70 is more closer than, than seven. And Imam al Dhabi wrote a book on Kabair, 70 major sin. I'll just mention one more. The sin number 19 is alcohol. 
Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mainza, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya yoladina amnu, O you believe, inna mal khamru al maifuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Well, anzabu al aslamu, dedication of stone, divination of arrows, rich to mermili shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First, the nimululukum to fluun, abstain from the handiwork that you may prosper. Here, Allah is saying that having alcohol, it's a Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. And we know today medical science has told us that there are so many diseases, cirrhosis of liver, cancer of esophagus, cancer of the stomach, there can be <laughs> peripheral neuropathy, cardiomyopathy, there can be stroke, and you can go on and on, give a talk, only for us to give the ill effects of alcohol. According to World Health Organization, every year, Two and a half million people die because of alcohol. And they say that 50% of the men have alcohol, 50% don't have of the world. Among the women, one third have alcohol. So on average, about 41.5% of the human beings have alcohol. And the World Health Organization says that 4% of the deaths are due to alcohol. And if 40% have, that means those who drink alcohol 10% of the people who drink, who drink alcohol die because of alcohol. This gives you a false happiness. Stay away from it. It's a Satan's hand of work. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sunnah Ibn Majah, verb number 5, hadith number 4113. Our beloved Prophet said that this life is like a prison for a believer and like paradise for the non-believer. So once there was a Jew who met Ibn Hajar Asqalani, Rahimullah. He was the judge of Egypt and a poor Jew wearing tattered clothes approached him and said, and he told him about the hadith, that what does your prophet mean by saying that this life is a prison for the believer and for the unbeliever, it is paradise. You know, I am a poor man, tattered, you are a rich man, you are a judge, you have such beautiful clothes, you are leading a luxurious life. How come? How can you explain this hadith? So Ibn Hajar Asqalani replied, saying that if you know you as being an unbeliever, what will happen to you in the akhirah? that you'll go to hell and you'll burn in hell at that time you realize that this life on this earth was jannah for you was paradise for you and if we the believers obey the commandments of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obey the teaching in the quran and sunnah and when we go to jannah we'll realize that what we had in this world whether you were rich or poor it was like a prison Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the mention in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6416, our beloved Prophet said, that a believer should lead his life in this world like a stranger, like a traveler. You know, when you're a traveler, your lifestyle is different. You know, I have come to Klantan for a few days. You don't expect me to go and buy a house. Fine, because I'm a traveler. So when you're a traveler, you see to it that you do things temporarily. So you don't have that desire for material wealth, for material goods. So you lead a life like you know you're temporary here. You're not going to be permanent. Then you're a true believer. A beloved prophet. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that a believer is the one who takes care of how we lead this life in this world. And a prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, point number seven, hadith number 7430, that a prophet said that look at the people who are below you in the worldly things, don't look at the people who are above you. 
you know, we look at the people who are rich, so okay, even I want, a, I want a house, like the rich person, rich neighbor of mine. Even I want a car, a Mercedes like my neighbor. Prophet said, look at the people who are below you. In the worldly things, don't look at the people who are above you. And I'd like to give you an example. That one there was an angel who came to a man and he told him that whatever you ask, I will give you. But what I will give to you, I will give your neighbor double. So the man asked, give me a Rolex watch. So the angel gives him Rolex watch. But to the neighbor, two Rolex watch. Then he says, give me a Rolls Royce car. So the angel gives him Rolls Royce car. And he gives two Rolls Royce car to the neighbor. I get one, he gets two. Then give me a bungalow with ten rooms. The angel gives two bungalows of ten rooms to the neighbor. The man is, what is it? Whatever I'm getting, my neighbor is getting double. So he says, that you break my one eye. The man tells the angel, you break my one eye. So that the angel breaks both the eyes of the neighbor. So you're more bothered about competing with your neighbor and winning over him than what Allah has given you. So the prophet said, look at the people below you. If you look at the people below you, you will come closer to Allah than look at the people above you as far as material things are concerned. There is a saying that I used to complain because I had no shoes until I saw a man who had no feet. I used to complain because I had no shoes until I saw a man who had no feet. So you are complaining to Allah that I have got no shoes, there are people who have no feet. So therefore, whatever you have, you thank what you have, count what you have, and you will be happy with it. Irrespective of what you have, that is a true believer. Whatever Allah gives you, Alhamdulillah. You will always, you have something to thank Allah. There's a person who was complaining to a scholar, that you know, I am so bad, so much in poverty, and you know, I am... Life is so miserable and problems and all. So the scholar told him, Okay, fine. If you give me your eyes, I will, I will give you 100,000 ringgit. He said, No, I don't want to give. I said, Why? I want to keep my eyes. Okay, if you give me your hands, cut off and give me your hands, I'll give you 100,000 ringgit. He said, No, no, I don't want to give my hands. Okay, give me your feet, I'll give you 100,000 ringgit. He said, No, no, no. Mashallah, you have got things worth hundreds and millions of ringgit. Then the poor man realized that what Niyama Allah has given is unbelievable. How many times do we thank? How many times do we thank Allah for the Niyama He's given us? How many times? For the house He's given us, for the clothes we wear, for the food we eat. For the water we drink. How many people thank Allah for the water? How many people thank Allah for the air that we breathe in? You know the air that we breathe? If you don't get the air for about 20, 30, 40 minutes, you will die. How many times do we thank Allah for that? So the Prophet said, look at the people who are below you. And inshallah you'll be more happy as far as worldly things are concerned than looking at the people who are above you. And a beloved prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, poem number 8, hadith number 6468. The prophet said that if, Allah says, that if I give a mountain of gold to a man, he will want a second. If I give the second mountain of gold to him, he would want a third. He will never be satisfied. It hardly takes a fist of mud for a person. That means even if you give a mountain of gold, and no one in the world has a mountain of gold, even Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, they don't own a mountain of gold. Allah says, this is the desire of man. If he gets one mountain of gold, he wants a second. If he gets a second, he wants a third. It will never end. This will never end. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 216. 
talking about when Allah tells you to go for jihad, for striving, you may hate a thing which is good for you and you may love a thing which is bad for you. You don't know, Allah knows. So Allah says that you may hate a thing which is good for you and you may love a thing which is not good for you. Allah knows and you don't know. Let me give you an example. Once there was a businessman who was going to catch a flight to go to New York to click a deal. And in that business deal, he was very positive that he would at least make $10 million. So he's going to click the deal, he's going towards the airport. And while he's going to the airport, there's a traffic jam. And the traffic jam is so severe that he reaches late at the airport and he misses the flight. And he says, this is the worst thing that happened to me in my life. That I missed a flight where I was going to go to New York and click a deal where I'd get $10 million. And he curses, this is the worst thing that happened to my flight. And he's very sad and he's on his way back to his home. He hears the radio. And on the radio it says, the flight that took off for New York, it crashed and all the people in it died. Then he says, ah, this is the best thing that happened to me in my life that I missed the flight. Imagine, maybe an hour back, few minutes back, he was cursing that the worst thing that happened to me is he missed the flight. And a few minutes later, an hour later, he says the best thing that happened is that he missed the flight. So Allah knows, you don't know. There are people who make dua that you know, okay, the young man says, I want a bike. And Allah doesn't answer his prayer. So he's, no, Allah many a time answers your prayers by not answering your prayer. He knows that if he had got the bike, he would go very fast, there would have been an accident, and he would have got crippled. His leg would have broken. So Allah answers your prayers by not answering your prayer. And I always say, that if Allah answers my prayer, I'm happy. But when Allah doesn't answer my prayer, I'm ten times happier. Because the first was my choice, the second was Allah's. Let me repeat it. That if Allah answers my prayers, I'm happy. If Allah doesn't answer my prayer, I'm ten times happier. Because the first was my choice, and the second was Allah's. So the choice of Allah is far superior than my choice. When Allah doesn't answer my prayer, I'm ten times happier. Now there's hikmah in it. This is the state of a believer. You pray something, alhamdulillah. If it doesn't happen, you say, summa alhamdulillah. Because Allah is the best who knows. And I would like to end this speech of Quran, Islam, the path to happiness. We know that happiness, the true happiness, is going to Jannah. Do you know which is the highest level of happiness? The ultimate happiness. We know the true happiness is going to Jannah. Which is the ultimate highest level of happiness? Which is the highest ultimate level of happiness? Is there anything higher than Jannah? Meet Allah. Close, we are going to meet Allah. All are going to meet Allah. It is Janita Firdaus al Allah seeing the face of Allah. Our beloved Prophet said the highest level is seen because in Jannah there will be levels. There are Jannah and Jannah. The Janita Firdaus which is high. Janita Firdaus al Allah is the highest. And seeing the face of Allah is the highest and no one will see always. So when you see the face of Allah, the Vaj of Allah, it is the best ultimate happiness. I like to end my talk with the prayers that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put all of us in Janet Firdaus al-Allah in the company of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Ambiyas and make us see the face of Allah as often as possible. Amen. Wa akhir dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Adam Hassan, uh, College Teknologi Darul Naim, Pengalan Cepa. Uh, Alhamdulillah and thanks to the organizer. Uh, to the organizer. Welcome to our respected guest, Dr. Zakir Naik and family. I would like to ask you one, only one simple uh, basic question. What would you say to the opinion that non-Muslims can, only, uh, can also enter Jannah or Paradise with the mercy or blessings of Allah? Maybe because he or she was doing good deeds during his or her life in this world. Since it is also not fair or unfair to the, uh, for the God or Allah to punish them just because they were born in the non-Muslim countries or born from non-Muslim parents. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please, Doctor. Before I answer the question, I would like to ask, is there any non-Muslim in the audience who would like to ask a question? If the non-Muslims in the audience would prefer them asking the first question, as was mentioned by the chairperson, are there any non-Muslims? Any non-Muslims have any questions? This is the opportunity. The non-Muslims are, are our guest of honors. I know that the percentage of non-Muslims in Klantan is a very small percentage. I'm aware that Klantan has got 96.2% Muslims. Are there any non-Muslims in the audience who would like to ask a question? Anyway, if any non-Muslims are there who like to ask a question, they can break the queue, they'll be given the first chance. The brother asked a question that can a non-Muslim by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enter Jannah? And isn't it two questions? And number two, isn't it unfair that a person because he's born in a non-Muslim family that he should not be allowed to go to Jannah? As far as the first part of your question is concerned that can a non-Muslim enter Jannah by the, say, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes. If Allah gives them hidayah, and if he becomes a Muslim, then inshallah he'll go to Jannah. If Allah wants, very easy. Coming to your second part of the question, that can a non-Muslim, because he's born in a non-Muslim family, you know, can he, why should he be prevented from going to Jannah? What is his fault? As I mentioned in my speech, for any human being going to Jannah, you require four criteria. Number one is Iman, according to Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number one to three. Number one is Iman. Number two, it is amal e that is righteous deed. Number three, it is inviting people to truth. Number four is inviting people to patience and perseverance. Now, I would like to ask a question to the brother, that when I was in school, when I passed my school in 1982, there were six compulsory subjects we had. When I passed my standard 10, six compulsory subjects, English, mathematics, science, history, Geography, Hindi. I'm asking you a question that in five subjects out of six, I get 100 out of 100. One subject, I fail. Will I pass 10 under 10? Yes or no? Will I pass? No. The rule is I should pass in all the six subjects, minimum 35 marks. Yeah, I may get 100 out of 100 in, in five subjects. But one subject I get below 35, I fail. This is the rule. So similarly, to go to Jannah, you require minimum four criteria. Iman, righteous deed, exalting people to truth, exalting people to patient person. You may have a non-Muslim who has done very great deeds. A lot of good deeds. You may call, I may not agree with it, but okay, done charity, etc. Some good deeds, not all. But has no Iman, does shirk. Allah clearly mentioned in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 48, and Surah Nisa chapter 4, 116, that Allah will never forgive the sin of shirk. If a mushrik asks for forgiveness and he repents, Allah will forgive him. But if he dies as a mushrik, Allah will never forgive him. So there's no chance of a non-Muslim who does shirk for him to go to Jannah. Regarding the question, what is his fault? There was a survey done on two tribes who did not come in contact with modern civilization. One was the Kapauku tribe and the other was Austrian Aborigines. These two tribes did not come in contact with modern civilization and when researchers went and tried to find out what was their way of life, 
They believed there was one God. They believed God had no idols, had no images. They did the sujood for praying to Almighty God. It was everything of Islam but a name. So if you let a person be on his fitra, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, every child is born in Deen al fitr He's born in an innate religion, he's born as a Muslim. Later on, he's influenced by his parents, by his teachers, by his elders, by his neighbors, and then he changes from a Muslim to a non-Muslim. That is the reason when a non-Muslim becomes a Muslim, the convert is not the right word, the right word is revert. He was a Muslim, he became a non-Muslim, then he came back to Islam, the right word is revert. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 53, Allah says, That soon we shall show them our signs in the further regions of the horizon until it is clear to them that this is the truth. So Allah takes it upon himself that every human being before he dies, Allah will convey the message. Whether you do dawa or not, whether I do dawa or not, Allah is not dependent on us. We are doing to get free sawab. Whether you do dawa or not, Allah says in the Quran, we will surely show them our signs in the further regions of the horizon until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Allah will prove to them that there is Tawheed, one God. But he may not accept because if he accepts Islam, then he, will, he may lose his friends, he may lose his family members, he may get lost in business, he may have to stop having alcohol, he may have to stop having drugs, so he doesn't accept. Who's to blame? He's to blame. That's the reason Allah says on the day of judgment, no kafir, no non-Muslim will ever object to the mercy of Allah. They'll only say, give us one more chance, and Allah will say, it's too late. So, Allah will give the message to every non-Muslim about Tawheed. Until it is clear to him. Then if he doesn't accept, who's to blame? He's to blame. So that's the reason, if a human being doesn't accept the Tawheed, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa Islam, whether we deliver the message or you know, Allah will deliver himself, he is responsible, and that is the reason he will not enter Jannah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, mic number two, question and, number two. And uh, we had one more speech before my speech. That is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the liberator of humanity. And if anyone has questions regarding that topic, you can surely ask my son, Farik, inshallah. Okay, thank you, doctor. Mic number two, question number two, please. My name is Saada. I'm from Selangor. I'm still a student in College Politik Mara. Uh, just a simple question. I want to ask, why does in Al-Quran, Allah said that the word, uh, I, Allah said in Al-Quran, the words Latah Zain, but not be happy. Uh, as we always see that people always depressed and seek for happiness. Thank you. Can you understand? <laughs> Can you repeat a bit slowly, sister, and loudly? Slowly oh. and loudly, yes, sister. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, the question is... <laughs> why does in Al-Quran, Allah say the words, La tahzim, not be happy? But people always see they want to be happy, not to be depressed. Do you understand? Sorry, uh, I didn't... Uh, Allah said, uh, Allah said, uh, you know, Allah said to us, uh, La Tazen, don't be happy. Not, uh, don't, don't, do not be don't sad. Be, <laughs> don't be sad. <laughs> I'm wondering which verse of the Quran. I'm trying to go back. Where Allah said, don't be happy. So I thought maybe, you know, because I'm not happy with the Quran. Okay. Don't be sad. Uh. Oh, yeah. Yes, La uh, Okay, Allah said, don't be sad. Uh, why Allah said, don't be sad, why he doesn't say, uh, be happy, okay? So this is the question, that why does Allah say in the Quran, don't be sad? Why doesn't he say, be happy? There are verses we say about, be happy also, and I've given many verses, but why does Allah say, don't be sad? And that's a very important point. Why does Allah say, don't be sad? Because a believer can never be sad. A believer... A true believer can never be sad. Why? Because he believes in Qadr of Allah. He believes in the destiny of Allah. One of the pillars of Iman is believing in the destiny in the Qadr of Allah. So when we believe in the Qadr of Allah, so when you do business and you make a profit of one million ringgit, you're happy. Alhamdulillah. 
Don't be sad. When you make a loss, also don't be sad. It is the qadr of Allah. Because if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that Allah has mentioned the risk, the provision of every human being 50,000 years before creation. So many times we think that, you know, okay, maybe if we bribe, maybe we'll get the deal and we'll make profit in the business. They are fools. What is in the qadr? Allah has written the risk, you will get it. You cannot get one ringgit more, you cannot get one ringgit less. Allah said, don't bribe, don't bribe. Sorry, Bakra chapter 2, but yet we want to bribe. Thinking that if we bribe, we'll make a bigger profit. We are fools. So Allah says, don't be sad. That means whatever happens, you have to strive according to the verse of the Quran, according to the Sahih Hadith, follow the commandment of Allah, then after that, what happens? Be happy. You know, people ask me, that, but this, do you think that, you know, what you did in India, maybe, are you sad that you did something in India which you should not have done? I said, I'm, I'm not sad. Qadr of Allah. And Alhamdulillah, there is a, a scholar who came from India and told, I don't know of any, I may not agree with him, I don't know of any Muslim who has done hijrat because of dawah. Hijrat. Left our home. And when we, after coming to Malaysia, when I, when I, in the month of Ramadan, going to the Tarawi, you sign the, you see the benefits, Allah says, those who give their home and they go out to Hijrat. The blessings, the award. So here yeah, Allah says, don't be sad, me a true Muslim can never be sad. He's always happy irrespective whether he's rich or poor. Whether at war or peace. Whether he has trials or tribulation or doesn't have. Whether he's sick or whether he's healthy. This is the don't be sad because our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's mentioned in a qadr, we are undergoing a test. Imagine if the teacher gives you a question paper. You, the teacher, yes, you may not, a normal human teacher may give a very difficult test and you may feel that, okay, he says this number six and verse number two Allah has created death and life to Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds for a believer the more difficult the test and if he passes higher is the award so as a believer if the test comes as long as you are following Quran and Sunnah you will be more happy that Allah wants to give you a higher status in Jannah that's the reason a believer can never be sad. A true believer can never be sad. Hope that answers the question. Please, uh, question number three, mic number three. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a question about the Quran. Uh, Allah said in Surah al radu verse number two, Allahu alladhi rafa'as samawati bi ghayri amadin tarawnaha Based on the verse that I just recite, my question is, does the sun revolve around the earth or vice versa? And if so, what is the proof? Thank you. The Buddha has quoted many verses of the Quran from Surah Rad and Surah Ambiya, Surah Yasin, and Allah says in Surah Ambiya chapter number 21, verse number 31, that it is Allah who has created the night and the day. Each one traveling in the orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word here used is yes bohun. The Arabic word yes bohun comes from the root word sabaha, which means describe the motion of the moving body. Now, many people who don't understand Quran and Arabic language, they think that Allah is saying that Allah is saying that the sun is revolving around the earth. No way does the Quran say that the sun is revolving around the earth. The word earth is not there. 
Allah says, Allah is the one who is the one It's Allah who has created the night and the day. Wa shams wal qamar, the sun and the moon. Kullun fi falki yasbuhun. Each one traveling in their own orbits. Now people like Taslima Nasreen, you may have heard of Taslima Nasreen, who wrote the book Lajja. She is the younger sister of Salman, uh, Salman Rajdi, coming from Bangladesh. So she says, how can you believe in a book which says, that the sun is revolving around the earth. How can you believe? The problem is she doesn't understand Quran. She doesn't understand Arabic. She has not studied. And then she wants to comment. Nowhere does Allah say that the sun is revolving around the earth. The Arabic word yes, bohun describes the motion of a moving body. If I use this word sabah for a person on the floor, it will not mean he is rolling. It will mean he's running or he's walking. If I use this Arabic word for a person in the water, it will not mean that he is floating, it will mean he is swimming. Similarly, when Allah uses it for a celestial body, like sun on the moon, it doesn't mean it is flying, it means it is rotating about its own axis. So the, so the Arabic word is, Kullun fi falaki yasbuhun, each one traveling in the orbits with its own motion. So it talks about rotation and revolution. Rotation and revolving. And we know today, the sun and the moon, including the earth, they revolve and they rotate about their own axis. So when I was in school, I knew that the sun revolved, but I never knew that the sun rotated. I never knew that. I did not know about it. When I read the Quran, I was shocked. Now science says that once when we have come to know, even the sun rotates about its own axis. And if you have the image of the sun on the tabletop, we find that there are black spots in the sun. And these black spots take about 25 days to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes 25 days to complete one rotation. So the Quran says, besides the sun revolving, it is also rotating about its own axis, which when I was in school, I did not know. So the, the Quran is, the author is our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is much more advanced than the best of scientists. So the Quran mentions much before our modern science discovered. And the Quran says the sun and the moon, they rotate, they revolve, and they rotate about their own axis. So this is what the Quran mentions. And Alhamdulillah, there is not a single verse in the Quran which is against established science. Alhamdulillah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, doctor. Question number four, mic number four. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to all the audience. My name is Zulaika Binti Abdumanan, graduation from Imperial College, United Kingdom. I just will be back um, last two weeks and just want to say welcome to you. We'll be so lucky to have you tonight. So I just got a simple question about happiness, peaceful manners, and any good vibe. It's nowadays, in here, people doesn't happy with a lot of things. They separate hates. Sister, too close to the mic. Can you be away from the mic, please? Oh, okay. Yes, and slowly, sorry. actually, because the mouth is too close to the mic, therefore it is. All right. You can't hear clearly. Yes, sister. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Can you repeat the question, please? Um... Okay, I'm saying about the happiness, peaceful, and manners. Nowadays, in here, people doesn't happy with a lot of things. They separate haters of their own, because of their own of self-reason. That's a lot happened. So my question is, how to practice that happiness on daily basis? Because based on my experience, on there, we live with a different culture and we didn't separate hates a lot you know what i mean and yeah that's that that's just my question if Thank i understood you. your question correctly you are saying that many people are not happy with many things here yeah. because of difference in culture exactly so how do we live in happiness that's your question exactly yeah sister i gave a talk on quran the path to happiness Islam, the path to happiness. The true happiness is in following the Quran. Exactly. Culture, if the culture of that country 
culture of that city matches with the Quran, no problem. You can follow it. If it doesn't go against the Quran, yet you can follow. Mubah. But if it goes against the Quran, you should not follow. So if it matches with the Quran, Alhamdulillah, it is Mustab or it is Far. If it doesn't go against the Quran, it is Mubah. If it goes against the Quran, it is Haram. For example, if I go to the Western country and, you know, wearing the suit. Many people say, Dr. Sakhir, like, why, why do I wear the suit? I say, there's no verse in the Quran or the Hadith which says I should not wear the suit. So I'm following the Western culture because when I go on the satellite channel, and now also, mashallah, you know, the cameras are here. We are going live on Peace TV. We are live on the YouTube, more than a million subscribers. We are live on the Facebook, about more than 17 million subscribers. On the Peace TV, more than 200 million, mashallah. They're watching live. So, if I'm following the culture of Western culture, but it's not going against the Quran, so wearing a suit and a tie is mubah. You don't get sawab for it, but it is permitted. Mubah. Optional. Can wear. If you wear, no problem. Don't wear, no problem. But if I say that I want to wear shorts, now that is against the Islamic culture. There's a satar that is there. So I cannot follow the culture which is against the Quran and the Sunnah. If it is for, like if I come here, mashallah, the culture here is that, mashallah, the women are doing hijab, that is fard in the Quran, so I should follow. I should follow the Malay culture, the, the, the women are covering themselves, it's a fard. You have to follow. Here have come, they with the black cap. It is muba. You know, what do you call that black cap? Surong? Songko, songko. So if you want to wear, you can wear. If you don't want to wear, don't wear. Because it is not a fard. Covering the head is sunnah. So I'm covering my head with a white cap. I mean, that's my signature cap. So covering the head is sunnah. Do it. You can wear with black, white, any color, no problem. So, if you are doing things to please others, that is fake happiness. Do it to please Allah. If Allah says, be obedient to your parents. But if your parents go against Allah and the Rasul, they don't follow your parents. So obeying parents must, as long as they don't go against Allah and the Rasul. If they do go against Allah and the Rasul, you have to disobey your parents also. But if you want to, you know, you, are, you want to satisfy your neighbor, your friend, you're more bothered, you know, that if I am going to, to, to the university, I should not wear the same dress which I wore yesterday, or which I wore day for yesterday, so we have a different dress for Monday, different dress for Tuesday, different for Wednesday, different for Thursday. All this is fake happiness. No, fake. It may get, or maybe temporary happiness. It's not haram, as long as you're wearing a proper hijab. But if you are doing things to satisfy people, as far as culture is concerned, if it is following Quran and Sunnah, you should follow. If it is not against Quran and Sunnah, not for Muba. If it is against, you cannot follow. So you have to do things, sister, to please Allah and follow the commandments of Allah in the Quran and the commandments of beloved Prophet in the Sahih Hadith. You will get ultimate happiness, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Question number five, mic number one. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my name is Imad al-Din bin Muhammad. I am from Selangor, and uh, my question is, uh, in the Quran, uh, many times it was uh, mentioned that uh, the khamr, the wine, is prohibited or forbidden. So uh, I think many people are uh, misunder mis misunderstanding and think that uh, the object of the wine is as it itself is prohibited. I think it's the, uh, the act, right? Of drinking it or do something with it. So, uh, can the objects be prohibited and uh, forbidden? Because usually the action or the things that we do with, with uh, for, for, for example, the pork is prohibited. Can the object itself be prohibited? The brother asked the question, 
that the Quran says that the alcohol is prohibited, so the drinking is prohibited, can the object be prohibited, depending upon. In the Quran, it clearly says, Ya in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 19, Ya amnu innam al khamru al maisuru, most certainly toxicness gambling, wal anzabu al aslamu, dedication of divine Ishna Fairu. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it, that is impossible. Gambling, haram, always haram. Even alcohol per se, it is haram. Unless, unless it is going to save your life. So there's a verse in the Quran, there are no less than four different places. Surah Baqarah chapter 2 was 173, in Surah Maida chapter 5 was number 3, in Surah Anam chapter 6 was 145, and Surah Nahal chapter 16 was 115, that if you unwillingly disobey God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if your life is in danger, then Allah is Rahman or Rahim. So under normal circumstances, if it is banned, it is totally banned. Gambling is banned. Object. So what good do you find in gambling, tell me? Huh? Is there something like halal gambling? You know, you have in the Gulf country, you know, they're called Islamic beer, called non-alcoholic beer. There's nothing like non-alcoholic beer. This is to fool the audience. Because even the non-alcoholic beer have a beer, but they have less than 0.5%. According to the Food Bureau in USA, anything less than 0.5%, if you don't mention it, is accepted. But even the non-alcoholic beer, according to me, it is haram. If you have maybe 10 cans of it, you will get you surely get intoxicated, depending upon your capacity. So this is a way of the Western country to misguide the Muslims, so that you get used to non-alcoholic beer, which tastes like beer. So when you go out, you don't get non-alcoholic beer, you start having beer. So what is haram is haram, unless certain things are mentioned specifically. Sometimes the full object is haram, sometimes only certain act is haram. Like being spent thrift. Allah says in the Quran, that being a spent thrift, is the brother of a devil. Allah says in the Quran. So, spending excessively is haram. Money per se is not haram. So, depending upon the verdict of the Quran and Sunnah, sometimes the full object is haram. Sometimes only a certain part, like spending excessively is haram. But money per se is not haram. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Question number five, mic number two. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Nur Fatin Fakhira dari Tanah Merah Kelantan and I study at uh, College Islam Antarabangsa Sultan Ismail Petra Kias. Um, okay, uh, we clearly that from your speech, um, uh, people will be get a true happiness when we enter the Jannah. As your, an as your uh, question for the uh, as your answer for the question one, we uh, only Muslim can enter the Jannah. Okay, my simple question is, is we, if we manage to make non-Muslim accept Islam, are we responsible to guide them? And what are your further actions to those who have accepted Islam with you before? That's all, thank you. The sisters asked a question that, as we heard from the talk, that the ultimate happiness that a person gains is uh, entering into Jannah. So what about if we guide someone? It is, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guides. But what if we convey the message of Islam to a non-Muslim? And if he embraces Islam, so will we, will we be responsible for his actions? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, wherein a sahaba came to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, by the name of Amr bin al-As. And he wanted to embrace Islam. Now before embracing Islam, he puts a condition to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that will my previous sins be forgiven? So our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he says, that don't you know Amr, that once you embrace Islam, your previous sins are forgiven. So by this hadith, we clearly understand that when a person embraces Islam, all his previous sins, they are forgiven. So a person, when he embraces Islam, it is as if he is like a newborn baby. So all the sins that he has committed, all of them, they are erased. But it is important when you convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims, that you have to do the follow-up with them. So once a person has embraced Islam, 
you do not have to stop then and there. You have to try to follow up. If you cannot personally follow up, then you give him guidance. For example, you, tell, you refer him to some Islamic organization. And all the good deeds that he does, even you will receive reward for the good deeds. So definitely, a person, he needs to follow up with all the non-Muslims. If he cannot personally, then he needs to guide them to Islamic centers. And whatever evil deeds that he does, but natural, he is not responsible for it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها No soul shall bear the burden of the other person. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Mr. Farik Naik. Question number seven, mic number three. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mr. Dr. Zakir Naik, Mr. Falik Naik. So, um, my name is Muhammad Shahmi, and I am a student from UITM Bukit Besi, Terengganu. Uh, some, of my, some of my friends are non-Muslim uh, and we always talk about religion and I have some of questions that I can't answer them clearly. So, the question is, uh, first question is about Qadda and Qadar, which is, in the concept of Qadda and Qadar, Allah has set the destiny for every humankind in this world. So, what is the purpose of Allah in creating humankind while he already knew the destiny of his creation. Uh, for an example, if Allah has said that a person uh, will not be a Muslim until he died, and then at the end of the day, he will go to the hell. So the question uh, he said, so where is the justice of Allah if Allah has not um, set him to be a Muslim in the in in this world. And my second question is about if Allah is so powerful, why did He create disabled person or handicapped? Thank you. Now there's two questions that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to write the qadr, the destiny, so what is the fault? Of the non-Muslim. Why will he go to hell, correct? Yes. yes. And if he's so powerful, then why did he create the handicapped people? Two questions. Number one, as far as the first question is concerned regarding Qadr, you should understand what is the meaning of Qadr. It's one of the pillars of Iman that every Muslim should believe in Qadr, that is destiny. But let me give you an example so that you can understand the answer better. Suppose in a classroom a teacher she teaches about 100 students. At the end of the year, the teacher says that this student will come out first class first. This student, he gets second class. This student, he will fail. So before the examination, the teacher predicts that this student will come first class first, this student second class, that student will fail. And the examination takes place. And whatever the teacher predicts, it comes out true. This student comes first class first, second class, and the student fails. Don't feel bad, but just an example. <laughs> I'm asking you the question that the student who failed, can he blame the teacher that because the teacher predicted I will fail, I failed? Can the student blame the teacher? Yes or no? No. No, because the teacher, by experience of one year, oh, this student, very studious, doing the homework properly, very intelligent, will come out first class first. Oh. This student, alhamdulillah, average. Second class, this student playing hooky, seeing movies, not coming to class, bunking, fail. <laughs> Who's to blame, the teacher or the student? The student. Student. Now, the difference between a teacher and Allah, Allah has ilme gab. The teacher may be one in a hundred times can make a mistake. Allah cannot. Allah has ilme gab. Allah knows in advance what you're going to do. So, in the Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is writing the destiny not because he's writing your doing, because you will be doing, Allah writes in advance. Let me give you an example. If you come at a crossroad, there are four roads, road number one, two, three, four. You can choose any. 
you choose road number two. Now Allah knows in advance. On the 7th of August, when you come at a crossroad, you'll have four options, road number one, two, three. You will choose road number two. So Allah will make gap. So he writes in the Qadr, on 7th of August, when you come on the crossroad to 2019, you will choose road number two. Whose choice was it? Yours or Allah's? Your choice. Yes. But Allah will make gap. So because Allah will make gap, he has written in advance. Now once you take road number two, you come at another three roads, A, B, C. You choose road number C. You had choice of choosing any. You choose road number C. So Allah knows in advance that you will choose road number C. So Allah writes, you pass your college. You passed a higher secondary, your A-levels. You can choose to become a doctor. You can choose to become engineer. You can choose to become lawyer. You choose to become engineer. Whose choice? Your choice. Allah knows in advance that after you pass your A-levels, you will become an engineer. So because Allah is, not because Allah is writing your choosing, because you will be choosing Allah writes in advance. For example, after you pass your studies, you can work hard and earn your living and you can rob. You rob. It's your choice. So Allah writes, you will rob. Who's to blame? You Allah. You. Therefore, Allama Iqbal, he says in one of the shairi in Urdu, Khudi ko kar itna buland ke ar takdeer ke pehle khuda bande se khud puche bata tari raza kya hai. Which means, oh, mashallah. Oh, people understand Urdu, huh? Yes, I'm told that many people I met here when I met even the speaker of the parliament, he said he spent five years in, in India, three years in Pakistan, mashallah. So the meaning of this is that Allama Iqbal, who was a great thinker, mashallah, he says in his couplet that make yourself so great. Make yourself so great that before Allah writes the destiny, Allah will ask you what is your desire. So here we come to know that Allah has fixed certain things. Like as I said in my talk, Allah has fixed the risk. That you will get 100,000 ringgit in August 2019. Now you have a choice. Either you rob 100,000 ringgit or you work hard and you earn it. Choice is yours. So you rob 100,000 ringgit. Who's to blame? You Allah. Allah wrote, you will get 100,000 ringgit fixed. But giving you the choice, you can work hard, you can do consultancy, or you can rob. You choose to rob. Who's to blame? No man. So Allah has given you a freedom. You make the choice. So you can't blame Allah. Otherwise, if you murder, who's to blame? Allah wrote in the takdeer, I will do murder, I murdered. Allah is to blame. Allah wrote in the takdeer that you had a choice of hard work or robbing. You robbed. You had a choice of doing good deed or murdering. You murdered. So the person who did the act, he's to blame. You may ask the question that if Allah knows everything, then why did he let us come in this world? If Allah knew everything, why didn't he put us in direct in hell and heaven? Very good question. Imagine the teacher says, okay, no examination, first class first, just pass, fail. The person who gets first class first won't object. The person who fails, how do you know I'll fail? So Allah knows, but you don't know. So all this is not for Allah. Allah already knows the moment you're born. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fatir chapter 35, the destiny is born. Allah knows. But on the day of judgment, you'll say, what proof? So Allah says, your eye will be a witness against you. Your organ will be witness against you. Your hand will be witness. You will have no doubt. You know, today you have all these gadgets. Allah doesn't require that. Allah already knew before. You know, we say Facebook, Facebook. On the day of judgment, everything clear. It will be so crystal clear. You did the mistake. You did the sin. You did the zina. You did this good work. Very clear. So on the day of judgment, no one, no kafir, no unbeliever will object to Allah's Justice. They will not say you are unjust. What will they say? Give us one more chance, Allah will say too late. Because if Allah wants to have a new test, he'll have to put us, bring us back again, correct? So now we've already gone to Jannah, why would we want to come back again? Coming to your last question. That if Allah is so powerful, why does he create handicapped people? If Allah wants, Allah says you could have made everyone Muslims. But this is the test. Why didn't he make everyone Muslim? Then where is the test? 
It is like me telling someone appears for medical examination. Why fail? Make everyone pass. If he makes everyone pass, then doctors will not start. They will not treat the patient. They will kill the patient. <laughs> why, is, why is Allah so powerful? Why is he creating handicap? See, Allah puts different people in different situations. The examination paper keeps on, defer, keeps on deferring. Now, if Allah wants, he can make everyone healthy. But where is the test? Allah says in Surah Mul, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah di khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So he is creating handicapped person. He is masoom. In other religion, oh, you did a sin next previous life, this life punishment. No. Every child is born masoom. He is created handicapped. Why? He is testing the parents. Maybe the parents are very good Muslim, praying five times a day give zakat, gone for hajj, maybe Allah wants to give them higher level. So person who is not of higher level, he will say, oh, he will, maybe he will cry to Allah, why did you give me a child which is handicapped? A person who is a believer, what will he say? Alhamdulillah, don't be sad. What do you say? Thank you, Alhamdulillah, at least I got a child. Through this child, it may be my way to Jannah. Because to take care of a handicapped child, Trials and tribulation, difficulty. Non-believer will say, okay, put him to death. Abortion. Cannot. Allah gives life, Allah gives death. Allah is testing you. He's testing the parents. If the parent is a good believer, they will strive, upbring the child, whatever they can. They go to Jannah. The child is masoom. And nowhere does it say that if you are handicapped, you will not go to Jannah. If you handicap, more chances to go to Jannah, Alhamdulillah. So Allah has power. He is testing different people, different people with different tests. Some people he makes rich and tells them. He is rich, he gambles, he squanders, goes to hell. If you are rich, you have to give in charity. Some people he makes poor. So Allah tests different people in different, irrespective whether you are rich or poor. Whether you are healthy or handicapped. You have to follow the guidance of the Quran. Same. Formula is one. Part to happiness is the glorious Quran. Islam is a part to happiness. If you follow this, inshallah, you will get ultimate happiness. Hope that answers the question. Thank you for the answer. If there are more questions, as I said, that there's one more talk by my son on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the liberator of humanity. You can even ask questions on the topic, inshallah. Best question number eight. Uh, mic number four. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Sanjay Bilavinti Hanafi, a student. Uh, I want to ask about uh, like Islam is happiness and Quran is the way of life. But then when I uh, keep uh, think, uh, reading the Quran, I feel that Islam is like burden. Because uh, which you said, a burden. Which you said, uh, with honor, how Allah honors us, He gives us responsibilities. And uh, in uh, Surah Azab, uh, chapter 33, ayat 72, about the amanah that Allah gives the mountains, but they doesn't want, and they give to the humans. So then, then Allah said that uh, we, we are zaluman jahula. Is, is it we are capable or not in being our slave and like uh, amana like that? <laughs> Thank you. This is the question that uh, the Quran has a part to happiness, and isn't it a burden on us that we are following Islam and trials and tribulation? And Allah says in Surah Azab, and that's right, that when Allah asked the mountains, would you like to take the test? They said no. We human beings were fools, Allah says. If you read the background that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in uh, Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse number 172, that Allah brought all the human beings from the loin of Adam al salam and asked them, that do you, do you know that there's one God? All of them said, yes, we believe. That means all of us believed in Tawheed. Now, we realize that Allah has different types of creation. And one of the best creation is the human beings. Where we have a free will to obey or not to obey. Allah gives us the guidance 
the human beings and even the jinn, they have a free will to obey or not to obey. The angels have got no free will. Angels obey whatever Allah says, they have no choice. So if you are a, so all the others are Muslim. The tree is a Muslim, the animals are Muslim, because they obey to Allah's commandment. We human beings have a choice. Now when choice is given, there can be two things. If you are a Muslim, like a tree, angel, okay, no problem. But if you are a human being, you have a choice of your own. You can obey Allah or you cannot obey Allah. If after the choice is given and if you obey Allah, you will go to Jannah. If when the choice is given and you don't obey Allah, you go to Jahannam. So Allah is asking, would you like to undergo the test? And the mountain said, no. We human beings were fool who said yes. Because if after the choice is given and if you obey Allah, you become higher than the angels. After choice is given and if you obey Allah, the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, you become higher than the angels. If you disobey, then you become like a Satan. Therefore, Allah says in Surah Nas, those who whisper into your ears, among them, there are men and jinn. You know, so we become like Satan. So now the choice is yours. One is just pass. Would you want just pass? Or would you want to try to get first class first? But while trying to get first class first, you may even fail. So we human beings, Allah says, are the johal, are the ignorant, are the fools, who said, we want to undergo the test. And now we are undergoing the test. This is what Allah says. On the day of judgment, now you may not remember, I don't remember. Quran says I believe in it. On the day of judgment, we will remember everything, inshallah. So we are undergoing the test. So therefore, if you stick to the Quran, Allah is merciful. Follow the guidance, inshallah, you will get ultimate happiness. Hope that answers the question. All right, question number nine, mic number one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ahla wa salam ila Kelantan. My name is Muhammad Sirajuddin Ashra bin Muhammad Noh. I am a student from University Technology Malaysia. Okay, uh, so back to history until now, there are always conflict between uh, Sunni and Shia. Uh, this, uh, this causes the wars, riots uh, between Sunni and Shia, especially in Middle East country. So, uh, uh, we as Sunni want make a peace, hope a peace and happiness uh, between them. So my question uh, is: uh, Is it any possible solution or any possible ways to solve this problem? That's all from me. Thank you. The brother asked the question that there's conflict between Shias and Sunnis, and there are wars going on. Is there any way to solve this problem? The only way to solve the problem. It is the Quran. In the Quran, there is no Shia Sunni. You know, when I made this statement, one Malaysian wrote a letter that Zakir says there is no Shia Sunni in the Quran. So he thought I said Shia Sunni are same. I never said that. I said there is no Shia Sunni. That means in Islam, there is no sect. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103. Wa tafarraku. Hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith. So whenever the Muslims differ, we have to come on the comment platform, the Quran and the Sunnah. Anyone. This, so we Muslims should be united on the basis of the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. This is a uniting factor. So if we stick and read the Quran and we implement it, there will not be differences. What is happening is more political. You know, even now, some, I mean, there are two groups of, or three groups of Muslims politically aligned, one group, this group, that group. And when you go into detail, this politics normally takes you away from Islam. I've given a talk on, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? And I told the major problem of all this, you know, Politics is there in Islam. The best politician, best example is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How to govern, how to rule, how to take care of the subjects, and Afo Khulfa Rashidin. Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali. Best example. If you look at the example, but today's politics is different. 
Today's politics, you have to more listen to your party than to Allah. So if your party says something and Allah says something else, you leave Allah aside and you follow the party. We have only one party, party of Allah. Here we have to follow the you know, president of the party. Our president of Muslim is only one Allah, no one else. So if you reach that level, that is the real level of Islamic politics. Unfortunately, most of the Muslim countries, I'm sorry to say, I don't know of a single Muslim country anywhere in the world which is following Islam in total. Sorry to say. I'm sorry to say. I don't know of a single Muslim country in the world. That's the reason we Muslims are in this position today. You know, today we Muslims are being hammered everywhere. We are looked down upon. Because we, want, we don't follow Allah and His Rasul. We are more afraid of the kuffar than Allah. So we go against Allah and we shake hands with the kafir. Why? Because they don't know happiness. If a Muslim politician knew about this happiness, you know, this seat, this kursi, nothing. This kursi, nothing. They don't know about the ultimate happiness. They are, look, they are going out of fake happiness and going out of temporary happiness. You know, I told some people go for power. Unfortunate. If our Muslim politicians read this Quran, and obey the commandment of Quran, obey the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The world will be a much more beautiful place. You won't have all these wars. You won't have all this turmoil. You won't have all this fiction. We get people close to the Quran and Sunnah. Anyone who calls himself a Muslim should follow Quran and Sunnah. Whatever Nabili gives. If the person doesn't follow Quran and Sunnah, doesn't follow Allah and his Rasul, and doesn't follow the Khulfa Rashidin, he's not a Muslim. If a person who doesn't believe in the Khulfa Rashidin, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you put Hazrat Abu Bakr on one pan, may Allah be pleased with him. And the full Ummah, except the Anbiya, on one side, his Iman and Taqwa is higher. And if someone abuses them, where can they be called a Muslim? So where is the question? We have to follow Quran and follow Sunnah and don't divide people. The best label you can give yourself is call innani min al muslimin. Say, I'm a Muslim. I'm first a Muslim, I'm last a Muslim. I'm here to follow the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unless you don't love Allah and his Rasul more than anyone in this world, as I told you, whether it be your manager, whether it be your boss, whether it be your CEO, whether it be your minister, whether it be prime minister, whether it be the king, if you don't love Allah more than anyone in this world, whether your father, whether your mother, whether your son, you cannot be a good practicing Muslim. So if the world leaders that we have today, 56 countries, majority Muslim countries, if they follow the guidance, and if they only fear Allah and no one else, the world would be a better place for the Muslims. The major problem is because they don't know true happiness. They're running after temporary happiness and fake happiness. You understand? Yeah. So if you know true happiness, you will not be afraid of anyone except Allah. Our politicians are afraid, okay, if I do this, this country will be very powerful, I will lose my seat, I will lose my chair. You know what they're doing? They're losing the chair in Jannah. Unfortunate. They're not good businessmen. That's the reason I'm here. You know, most of the political parties in India, they wanted me. They even called me to campaign, you'll be shocked to know. I said, if I enter politics, I'll have to leave my Islam. Because the world... It's a different place today. Islam has politics. But to follow Islam on the Quran and Sunnah, unless you have the right people, and inshallah it will come back. There are hadith saying that inshallah it will come back and the Muslims will rule for seven years, mashallah, with the full proper Quran and Sunnah, inshallah. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't know whether we live to see through that. If we can live, alhamdulillah, whether we live or not. What you should do and I should do, we should follow Quran Sunnah. Forget, Allah will not question you what they are doing in the Gulf country. Allah will question you, are you following Quran Sunnah or not? Correct? So many of the people point their finger at the other Muslim leaders. Allah will question you, what have you done for Islam? Have you followed Quran Sunnah or not? So we should follow Quran and Sunnah and see to it at least our happiness, our Jannah is secured. Hope that answers the question. Doctor, is it possible uh, for us to have one more questions? It's the last question. All right. One more round. Last question. Yeah. One more. One more round. Uh, yeah. One more round. Maybe last. I uh, did number four. 
Okay, uh, question number question number ten, mic number two. Then uh, number three and number four will be the last. Okay, eleven, twelve. Right. Uh, right. Please. Assalamualaikum. My name is Aina Tayra uh, from uh, College Islam Antarabansa Sultan Ismail Petra. This question is from uh, my friend known Muslim uh, in Sabah. Her question, who, uh, who is the Lord in Islam and who is Muhammad other than Messenger of Allah? That's all. Thank you. The sister asked a question that her non-Muslim friend asked her that who is Allah and in Islam and who is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him if I understood correctly. The best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam or regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the one and only. Allah who samad. Allah, the absolute, the eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufwan ahad. And there is nothing like unto him. This surah ikhlas is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the glorious Quran. And regarding the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is also mentioned in the other scriptures of the major world religions. Time does not permit me to discuss all the references, but I've given a talk on concept of God in major world religions, which talks about this in detail. I'll just mention a few references. If you read the Hindu scriptures, it is mentioned, the Brahma Sutra, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is, Ekkam Braham Dyutya Naste. Nehna Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai. Dusra nahi hai. Nahi hai, nahi hai, zara bhi nahi hai. There's only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. This is the fundamental creed of Hinduism. It is also mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasi pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. It is mentioned in Shandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam Ividityam. God is only one without a second. Same thing is mentioned in the Christian scriptures. If you read the Bible, it is mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. Shama Israelo, adno ilahino adno ikhad. Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, if you read the Jewish scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Judaism. Same thing even in the New Testament. It talks about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. So when you're talking to your non-Muslim friends, whether they be Christians, whether they be Hindus, you can mention the references from their religious scriptures. And all the religions, all the major world religions, they talk about the oneness of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Coming back to your second part of the question, regarding Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. When we are doing dawah to non-Muslims, we can mention to them verses from their religious scriptures which talk about the coming of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. As we know in Islam, it, there are several places which talk about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, which says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهُ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْنْ عَلِيمًا That Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is not the father of any of you men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. And Allah has full knowledge of all things. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is also mentioned in the Christian scriptures, it is mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12, that the book is delivered to thee, saying, read this, pray thee. And he said, I am not learned. Referring to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 19, talking about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even the Hindu scriptures talk about the coming of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I've given a talk on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the various world religious scriptures. So in this way, you can convince the non-Muslims using their religious scriptures to talk about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to talk about Tawheed, and to talk about the coming of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
Therefore, the master key for doing dawah is mentioned in Surah Ali Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kul ya ahlal kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa in bayna wa baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which the first term? Allah na'bud illallah. That we worship none but one almighty God. So the main focus when you're doing dawah is to talk about tawheed, that is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mr. Farik Naik. Question number 11, mic number 3. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my name is Abdul Malik. I am from Kenya. Um, newly revert one year ago here in Malaysia. And uh, I just have a few questions that is been disturbing my mind a little bit. Uh, if you would have, uh, if you can clarify for me on the part of uh, Tawheed, uh, on the part where Allah says that uh, in Surah Azumar, that's Allah says that we are the one who sent this Quran and we are the one to bear this Quran. So Allah testifies to this that He says we. Why can't Allah just say I? And then on the second part of it, on the on the part of Tawheed, that is to believe in Allah and the Messenger. On the messenger part of it, uh, can we attest that uh, when uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was born, he was born miraculously as well. And uh, one of his uh, miracles that he received is being circumcised inside, inside the mother's womb. Uh, so on, on that part, when Jesus Alayhi uh, Wasallam was baptized and then he according to what I was learning in Christian, did he, like he said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave you. That was the Holy Spirit. Can we say that the Holy Spirit is the same, same that Jesus was talking about that would be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I hope you understand. Brother has two questions. Normally we prefer one question at a time so that we can answer better. <laughs> the brother has two questions. Uh, the first one, brother, was which one? Uh, Surah Azumar. Why does Allah say we are the one ah, who send the Quran? Brother, why not say I? Uh, Allah doesn't send Surah Azumar why we reveal the Quran and God from corruption. Allah sends Surah Hijr, chapter 15, verse 87, that we have revealed the Quran and we shall guard it from corruption. It is not Surah Zumar, but Allah says we several places in the Quran, in many surahs and many verses, including Surah Zumar. The reason Allah uses we and not I is because there are two types of plural in many languages. In English language also, there is a plural of number and a plural of respect. Plural of number means there are five people, we say we. But when the Queen of England, when she speaks, she says, we said this. So that's called as a royal plural. So similarly, when Allah sometimes uses I, sometimes uses we. When Allah is saying we, it is the royal plural, which is there in English language, which is there even in Hindi, Urdu. So it is not the plural of number, it is plural of respect. Therefore, no Arab will ask this question because he knows about it. When we say nahnu, it says we, it's the royal plural. Coming to your second question that about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he was born without being circumcised and you talked about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that was it this uh, same person, Holy Spirit? So main question is, was this Holy Spirit the same at the time of Jesus Christ and the time of Muhammad? That's your main question? Yes. Main question about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yes. Yeah. Yes, see, all the, there are many similarities between the Quran and the Bible. There are many similarities between Christianity and Islam. When, we, when, when, when the Bible speaks about Gabriel, it is the same Jibreel as Salaam what we believe in. So what they speak about the Holy Spirit, yes, we also believe in the same angel. But there are many things mentioned wrong which doesn't match with the Quran. So that which doesn't match with the Quran, we disagree with. What matches with the Quran, as far as the Bible and the Quran is concerned, or Christianity and Islam is concerned, Quran is the Furqan. 
It is the criteria to judge right from wrong. So what matches with the Quran, we say we agree with it. What doesn't match and doesn't go against, it's ambiguous. Maybe right, maybe wrong. So our beloved Prophet said, there is no harj. There is no problem if you quote the scriptures of the Ahli Kitab. But what goes against the Quran, that we reject. For example, the Christians say that Jesus is God, peace be upon him. There is no mention in the Bible, Jesus is God. So we reject Jesus is God, we say Jesus is the messenger of God, peace be upon him. And nowhere does the Bible also say that. So whatever in the Bible matches with the Quran, we have no objection, we agree with it. What doesn't match and doesn't go against it is muba, maybe right, maybe wrong. What is wrong, we reject it. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Question number 12. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Nurkuratul Ain Binti Kamaruddin from Glanton Matriculation College. I have a question which is Allah has mentioned and promised in Al Quran that there will be pleasance for Mujahideen. How do we convince ourselves to stand in those promises of Allah to keep reminded of the beauties of jihad? Thank you. Right, that is the last question. Thank you. Sister, if I heard you correctly, the Mujahideen will get what? I mean, the question wasn't clear. The Mujahideen will get? Um, Allah has mentioned and promised that there will be pleasance for Present. Mujahideen. Yeah. Present. Pleasance. Pleasance. Pleasant. Yeah. Allah promised uh, Present or happiness. Happiness, huh? A pleasure. A pleasure, yeah. A pleasure. For the Mujahideen? For the Mujahideen. So what is the question? Um, how do we convince ourselves to stand in the promise of Allah and to see the beauties of jihad? This is the question that Allah has promised a lot of pleasures and rewards for Mujahideen. How do we convince ourselves in the way of doing jihad. You should realize that jihad is of two types. Jihad actually means to strive and to struggle. Whenever the verse talked about jihad in the time of Makkah, there was no war. It talked about struggling and striving. Later on, yes, there's one type of jihad which you go and fight a war in self-defense or when the enemies come and attack. So both, alhamdulillah, Allah has promised high level. And Allah says with the verse I quoted in in my talk, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 216, that when Allah tells to go to jihad, you may hate a thing which is good for you, and you may love a thing which is not good for you. Here many of the people, you know, they will think, oh, we don't want to go for jihad, we may get killed, we may die. So here Allah is saying, you may hate a thing which is good for you. That means, if you go and if you die in jihad, you are a martyr, you are a shaykh, inshallah you will go to jannah. It's, you will get true happiness. So when you go for the war, what Allah is talking about, surely if you get killed, you will go to Jannah. And if you come back victorious, then you get the booty. You get the war booty. So it is beneficial. And the other type of striving is struggling. Like how the Quran says in Quran says Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 52, that you have to strive and struggle with the Quran. So here Allah is talking about doing dawah. So here this jihad what Allah is talking is about struggling and striving that is doing dawah. So that's what we are doing. Today, the best jihad is to do dawah. You have to struggle, you have to remove the misconception from the mind of the non-Muslim and tomorrow's topic of mine is on the same topic, misconception about Islam. And there, inshallah, if you attend, you'll get more details about this topic. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Thank you, Dr. Alhamdulillah. A big thanks to you, 